Hi everyone. So that's that's how low my high is. Nice. So I, I realized, I, I didn't know that there's been five J's on the beach. I, I live down the road, actually, in Malaga. I've been here 40 years, and it took them five years to invite me. But anyway. Okay, uh, let's start. Uh, my credentials, I don't normally do this, but to give you some background, uh, I talk a lot about, I, I rant a lot about things. And on the side, I also give some uh, tech talks. I've been in the industry for a very, very, very long time. Uh, I've, like even before punch cards were a thing, I was in the industry. And you may be asking what this talk is about. So it's a sequel to Silver Bullet Syndrome. Now, how many of you have seen Silver Bullet Syndrome? Nobody, great. Well, then it, it's fine, it doesn't matter. I'll tell you what that talk was about. That talk was about me ranting at the industry. And the industry just doesn't stop giving me things to rant about. But as with many sequels, there's a risk. Unless there is one movie that I love that the sequel was way better than the original one. Can anyone guess it? What? What? No, Ted 2. If you have not seen Ted 2, you should go and watch Ted 2. But since there's a lot of things that I had from the first one, I don't want to call it a sequel because then if someone's seen the original one, they'll be like, oh yeah, but that was a lot of repeat stuff. But first of all, I don't care. But second of all, just so that we don't end up in that situation, I'm calling this the director's cut, okay? And uh, I want to take, oh, and by the way, um, Alexandra said that this is a conference to come to, to learn, to be inspired, to go out and do great things. Uh, this talk is not about that. You're not going to learn much. You're not going to be inspired. I don't even know why they put it as a keynote because now you don't have any other options. You've got to basically sit here or go outside. Uh, but anyway, it's, I know it's hard for you, but just, just bear with me. So let's take a step back and ask ourselves, why are we here? I essentially, I really love the second one. Is like, we are such pessimists in life, right? We're just, why are we here to suffer? It's like, that's the most searched for thing in Google. Why are we here to suffer? But like not talking about the philosophical aspect of life, why are we here in, in technology? Is it to solve interesting problems? How, you, how many of you are here to solve interesting problems? Yeah, okay, four or five people. How many of you are here to make boatloads of money? More people. And I'm assuming that those that have raised their hands don't live in Spain because... Here in Spain, you don't make boatloads of money on technology. To automate everything. I, will, I used to love automating everything. Like, I used to love it. When I, when I learned that with programming, I could automate stuff, I was like, oh, I can make people's lives simpler. And then one day, someone said, you actually took my job away. I'm sorry about that. But was it to help people? Yes, that was one of the things as well. Like, you start to automate stuff, and you're like, oh, this is cool. I like to help people. Et These are the reasons that we're in this, right? To solve people's needs. And talking about needs, the year was 1990, right? And back then there was this guy called Tim who was a web developer. And he needed to do a few things. He needed to manage docs. And because he needed to manage docs, he came up with this system whereby he invented this HTTP protocol, this HTML language. And then, of course, back then, there was nothing for these things to talk. So he invented this thing called the browser and this other thing called the web server that would talk to the browser. And then this you know, website where he would host all of these docs. And this was around 30 years ago. Today, we have your typical CTO of some grocery store that says, our system consists of a distributed set of microservices that talk to each other using GraphQL. Messages are stored in ActiveMQ and using Kafka as a fail-safe option. We use serverless technology to calculate data, which is stored in Redis. We're looking to adopt blockchain. And you think to yourself, why? Like, why are you even doing this? You know, sometimes I wish there was like a Gordon Ramsay of tech that would just go into places and say, what the are you doing? Why are you mixing this shit together? And, and before you tell me that, you know, no, but yeah, Gordon Ramsay, actually 90% of the restaurants he went to failed. Don't worry, I was wrong on the internet and someone pointed it out. I don't care. I'm not there to give advice. I would just like to go and rant. So if anyone is looking, I'm looking for producers to put this show together. But back in the day, and back in the day when I started in this whole world of the internet, I actually started mostly at a local company, 
and uh, we were an ISP. So, you know, it, it was the time when, I don't know if any of you remember uh, uh, dial-up. Do you remember the dial-up? Da dang dang dang. No, no, okay. And, and we used to have this thing called a frame relay. So we were an ISP company that we used to have a frame relay connection to the internet. And then people would call in to us and uh, tell us that, you know, like they connect and then we would give them access to the internet. It was really hilarious because back then Telefonica, which was the phone company here, they didn't even know what they were providing, right? So you would call Telefonica and say, hey, our frame relay is down. And they're like, are you connected to the internet? Like asking you questions, they didn't even know how to respond to us. But anyway, we were this ISP company and we used to do websites and we used to do website for real estate. There was a boom, you know, the, a, a big boom in, uh, in, in Malaga, uh, a big real estate bubble, kind of like the one that's happen, happening every, every so often. And everyone was selling houses. And of course, my boss would come to me and say, okay, we want this page with this house up on the website, right? And this was problematic because every time they would fax us the sheets and you had to look at the sheets and you know put the stuff online and then they would email you the photos and stuff like that and it was a pain and so we started to put together something that would make it a little bit easier and then that's where the darkness started which by the way does anybody know why the logo of uh uh, CGI is also the logo of Dark Side of the Moon. I have no idea, but that is the logo of CGI. Now, if you're not familiar with who, who knows what CGI is? No? Okay, it, it stands for Common Gateway Interface. That's what a web application was back in the old days. And essentially what it did was that you had like an executable. Most machines used to run Linux. So you had an executable and then the web would call to this executable, do some processing and give something back and you would display that, right? And it was an executable. So the, the problem that happened that every time someone would call this, it would request a new one. So it wasn't really memory efficient. It was kind of like a function, kind of like serverless. And so there were options that were more efficient. That's my claim to fame. Like 20 years ago, I wrote this um, uh, tutorial about ISAPIs. And ISAPI and NSAPI were the, the Microsoft version and the Netscape version of that CGIs, which essentially improved on it because they started to become a DLL. So instead of having an executable, the first request would launch this into memory, and then it would stay in memory, and it would be able to handle more requests in a more efficient way. And the idea was very simple. You had a web browser, it would make a call to a server that maybe would talk to a database, and then it would spit out this thing called HTML that would intermix the stuff that was, you know, on the HTML with some data. It was just how things works, right? Nowadays, we call it server-side rendering. And then what happened is that someone said, ooh, let's do some scripting. And then the world just collapsed. So we, we started to do some scripting, and they came up with this thing called JavaScript. But of course, the language that's invented in five days is very hard to understand, and nobody really understood it. So they invented jQuery. And jQuery was really good, because now you could do stuff without even knowing what you're doing or understanding what you're doing, let alone understanding JavaScript. You didn't have to understand JavaScript. When you used to say to people, do you know JavaScript? They said, no, I know jQuery. It was so much easier. You could do a whole bunch of stuff. But then at some point, someone said, this is wrong, right? Because we're refreshing the whole page. And we've got this cool JavaScript technology. And there was this thing called AJAX, which stood for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Of course, at some point, someone said XML, no. So then they were doing AJAG, which was Asynchronous JavaScript and JSON. And or someone was just doing age, I don't know what. They were sending back whatever the hell they wanted. So they're like, oh, we got this thing. You know what? We can do this thing called single page applications. And now it just went like this, right? Single page applications. And of course, what do we do? We do best. We come up with a framework, AngularJS, which you know you had to take a master's course to upgrade from version one to version two. And but AngularJS is too complicated and it's too heavyweight, and we don't like it, and we're gonna come up with a better solution. And then we came up with React. And React tried to simplify things. React tried to say, look, this is actually very, very simple, and we can do it in a very efficient way. It had, um, uh, it was called the Flux architecture, and, and it was trying to kind of like make things very simple, but of course, some people didn't really understand this. I think some people still don't understand this. And someone said that I'm gonna come up with another architecture called Reflux. I didn't find a diagram or a logo for it, so I just used that. And of course, 
all of these things came with different patterns, right? I mean, the original small talk pattern was MBC, model view control. It was very simple. You had a model, data, whatever. You had a view, what the person sees, and you had this thing called a controller that basically allowed these two things to work together and you could test it and stuff like that. But then, you know, the people that were doing kind of like uh, desktop development, they're like, no, MVC doesn't work for us. We're going to do this thing called MVP, right? And MVP is model view presenter. And then someone said, no, you know, the whole MVC and MVP doesn't really work. I'm going to do this other thing called model view view model. And you're like, what? Well, wait, wait. And then someone said, it's not about controls, it's about intentions, and I'm gonna do model view intentions. And you like look at all of this mess, and you're like, what the hell is even the difference between all of this? No, it's very subtle. Anyway, and then of course now we're in the world of Vue.js, right? And then at some point, some people started to say, this whole SPA thing is giving me performance problems. Uh, maybe it would be better if we could get the server to render stuff, <laughs> right? And now we're like, oh, why don't you use server-side rendering to improve performance and user experience? So we went through all of this complexity for what? Doesn't matter. So you do it the way you used to do it, right? So now I've got, for example, uh, this, is, uh, this is my website. This is, this is a website for a product I work on, which is called Ktor. Um, and this section is brought to you by JetBrains. No. Um, it's worked by it's Ktor, and it's a static website like with five pages. It doesn't have a lot of dynamic stuff. And I'm like, I say to the web team, so what can I use for this? They're like, oh, use Gatsby. And this is Gatsby. And like, I don't even understand it. And just like, I just want to spit out some HTML. Yeah, but Gatsby is really, really flexible. So 12 years of progress, right? And this is in 2016. The, the, the version for 2022 doesn't even fit. So, and if you look at the applications that we create, we actually do creation of stuff. We create records, we read records, we update records, and we delete records. Essentially, we do CRUD like the majority of our um, applications are very beautiful interfaces on databases, right? The only reason we do it is because we don't want people to learn SQL Management Studio. And we started to do this and we wrote some code. And we said, you know what? I'm writing some code to read stuff from a database or I'm writing some code to create stuff in a database. And we did this for one application and we're like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna build a second application and we're gonna repeat the code or we've got to do a second version of the slides and we're going to repeat the code. And then we're like, okay, this doesn't really work because repeating code is, is bad, right? So we're going to write a few utility functions. And then that utility functions was really cool for that app, but as soon as you wanted to go to the second app, you're like, well, I'm not going to drag in the first app to it, right? I'm going to write a library. And that library is really nice because it allows me to reuse these functions across my different applications. And it was nice and simple, it was good, right? But then at some point we're like, wait, wait, there's a mismatch here, something is wrong because I'm reading from a relational model and ever since I was born, they told me that I have to think in objects, right? I need to model the entire world as objects because that's how you do it. And what did we do? Well, we wrote a framework and we called it an object relational mapper or an ORM. And it didn't matter whether we were using relational models or not, we wanted our ORMs, right? And when we moved to a document database, we're like, yeah, but I still want my ORMs. And when we moved to a column-based database, yeah, I still want my object relational mappers. But of course, these object relational mappers starting to give us some issues as well. Yeah, I wanna do, I wanna get all my invoices. Right, okay, and it's, it, there's a relationship to the line. Right, I'm gonna pull all the lines. No, but I'm gonna pass in a flag to say, don't pull the lines in. Okay, but then that model and that object doesn't represent it all the time because someone I do sometimes I do want the lines. Okay, let's create another one. And we started to create all these things around the ORMs to make our life easier. And of course, nobody in their right mind would actually use an ORM directly, would they? They would create an abstraction over the ORM just in case one day they want to swap out that ORM. Now, I ask you, how many times have you swapped out your ORMs? Yet, how many times have you created abstractions over it? Yeah? I did, at least. And they told us that we're designing things wrong, and thus came the big divide. Now, the big divide was this thing called command and query responsibility segregation. Who's heard of that? Yes. So back in the day when this was invented, Google didn't even understand what it meant. So when you would Google CQRS, it would say, did you mean cars, right? 
So you can see here that it says that's, that's, the local, that's, the, that's where the idea of this block came from. Did you mean cars? Because nobody even knew what CQRS was. And CQRS was this really, really simple concept. It was, hey, you know what? Instead of having this complex ORM, why don't you have some functions that create data and some functions that read data and keep these things kind of separate, kind of like how we used to do it, right? It came from the idea of command and query segregation from Bertrand Meyer that had the same concept. And it was just doing this in data. But then people caught wind of this and it was a whole new thing that had opened up, right? And somehow, somewhere along the ways, because partially one of the guys that invented this, whose name is Greg Young, he used to do this thing called event sourcing as well, which was kind of like, instead of storing databases, in, in databases, storing the actual data, I'm going to store an event, and then I'm gonna recreate that data based on the event. And everybody started to think that if you're doing CQRS, you gotta do event sourcing as well. Of course, it didn't help that Greg's own company created a database called Event Store and was promoting CQRS. And if that wasn't bad enough, around the same time, this other awesome thing came along, which was called domain-driven design, right? Now, back then, if you would go to someone and say, I'm just writing an application that does this, and you said it's CRUD, you would be looked down on. Like, really, that's your life? You just create CRUD applications? No, you need the complexity of domain-driven design. You need to get your application and divide it up into this um, isolated different uh, domains and you need to use ubiquitous languages and you need to do all of this and you need to read the Eric Evans books. And of course, Eric Evans book was like 500 or 600 pages. And the only thing everyone ever got out of it was two things. One, I need to use a repository pattern. Two, I'm gonna name all my objects as aggregate stores. And that's it, I'm doing domain-driven design. That's all I needed to do. And then, of course, this started to bring in its own complexities. So people started to say, no, to deal with this, you need to come up with hexagonal architectures to deal with domain-driven design. And slides like this, which you don't even understand what you're doing anymore, other than I've got an object called aggregate root, and that's all I care about, and I'm doing domain-driven design. And of course, tool vendors said, you know what? We can try and sell our tools with domain-driven design. I mean, how does Visual Studio fit in with domain-driven design? I have no clue, but apparently it's a, it's a, a Riyadh fit. I assume they meant a great fit. But it started to work. And the whole world moved into this complex thing because why? We didn't really even need it. Then, of course, no, again, this is we are doing it wrong, and you've got this big thing, and the architecture needs improving, and you know, you've got this massive, massive, massive monolith, and you know where I'm going here, right? Because the monoliths aren't good. You've got everything in a single application. You need to split those up into what we call microservices. And then we started the conversations around how big should my microservice be? And like, I don't know, but it should be sufficiently small. Okay, what does that mean? Well, does it mean that it needs to be a class? Well, it depends. Depends on what? Well, look, I sell some consulting services around this. If you want, we'll talk further. No, but um, how many classes should a microservice have? And, there were, and, and we started to see blog posts about how many lines should a microservice be? Or, and if it's only three lines, is it now a nano service or still a microservice? And as Simon was saying, you know, if you're doing micro monoliths incorrectly, microservices isn't gonna help, or put in a more subtle way, if you've got a pile of shit, you're gonna end up with a whole bunch of shit, right? It's not going to help you solve the problem. And how are all of these microservices going to communicate with each other? There was, of course, REST. Now, REST was a dissertation by Royal Fielding, who wrote a whole bunch of things and was talking about how essentially the web or HTML and HTTP, et cetera, can help represent state. He called it Hatios. That was like the essence of, of REST, right? It's how I can use the web and many of the things that already exist in order to improve the decoupling of my services, et cetera. What did we pick up from REST? Pretty URLs returning JSON. 
which is HTTP, but it looks much better if I say REST, right? I've got a domain-driven design building microservices with REST. And then someone said, oh, REST sucks, and I'm going to create GraphQL, and then everyone is now using GraphQL. So when I look at my website, static, I have a, a, a GraphQL query to get back some icons. And of course, all of this requires building. And if we go back to the old days, we used to have source code that we used to put through this thing called the compiler that used to check to make sure the source code is valid, and then put it through this linker to bring in some libraries, and you got your application. Now, there was a problem with that because the problem was that there was a lot of command line options, and it was kind of hard for you to memorize. And we started to create these script files and these batch files, .bat or .cmd or whatever you want to call it. And then there was this make file, which was kind of nice because it allowed you to essentially put everything that you wanted building and get it done. If you're in the JVM space, we had Maven, right? In the Microsoft space, they had MS Build. Now, at some point, Someone looked at the Maven and someone looked at the uh, 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 MS build and they're like, ugh, it's XML. It's that horrible language that is very explicit and tells me exactly what I need to do. It's disgusting. It is disgusting. I don't want that. And there was this other thing that came about which was called Ruby, which was a beautiful language, or so they say. I mean, I never did Ruby, but it is a beautiful language. And uh, someone said, well, you know what, this is, this is like, if I could take this amazing, beautiful language that I have, which is Ruby, and I can make it uh, kind of use that for my build process, that would be awesome. And thus came Rake. Do you get it? It's a play on make with an R. And what did C Sharp get? Cake. And what did F Sharp get? Fake. And yes, JavaScript did get Jake. But JavaScript also got Grunt, Gulp, and of course now we've got Webpack, which is, I, I, I don't even want to touch Webpack. Now in the, in, the, in the JVM space, what did we get? Well, we got Gradle, right? So Gradle is awesome, right? Because look, this is my XML, horrible. I don't like reading this. Look at my Gradle file, so much shorter, right? And um, okay, it has a couple more files, but it's still kind of small. And the idea here is, of course, that you don't need to tell, me, tell the Gradle what, how to do it. You just need to tell it what you want, declarative. Now, in order to figure out what you want, you need to read 60 chapters of a manual, which is going to be useless anyway, and you always end up in Google asking, how do I add this? How do I do that? How do I do this? How do I do that? And the last one, of course, is Gradle, how to clear cache, which has its own subset on Google, which is how do I uh, refresh Gradle project in IntelliJ? How do I do it in here? How do I do it in that? And I say that essentially the best way to get into farming is just to remove everything on your computer, just give up and, and say, it's over, I'm done. And of course, at JetBrains, we adopted Gradle, right? We, we came out with Kotlin, and we're like, OK, we're going to support Maven and Gradle. And then the Android folks are like, oh, we love Gradle. No, actually, I don't think any Android person says that. Any Android developers here? No? OK. And um, so we are kind of like, OK, Android folks use uh, Gradle, so we're going to uh, do that for our Kotlin multi-platform projects. Now, if you're not familiar with Kotlin multi-platform projects, it's this idea that you can basically share code. Right? You can write the same code, share it across multiple uh, projects, targeting different outputs. So you save a lot of time by sharing code. Now, that time that you save, obviously, we're not going to give it back to you so that you go and spend it with your family, friends, or do whatever you want. No. Instead, you can spend that time configuring our Gradle projects. Okay? And talking about configurations, remember how XML sucks? Yes, XML did suck, and someone said, let's use JSON. Now, if you look at JSON, that looks pretty inoffensive, right? It's nice. I mean, it's OK, yes? You can read it, but someone said, no, you can't. JSON isn't human readable. And you're like thinking, OK, but it's not like I spend all my life reading JSON. It's not like I read a novel in JSON, right? Sometimes I look at a configuration file in JSON. No, but it's not readable. We need something better. We'll call it YAML, right? And we'll take advantage of white space, because it's a thing. And we'll have 150-page specification for YAML, right? 
Now, you don't need to read all this. You just copy versions off of GitHub. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. Go to Stack Overflow or go to Google, and you'll figure it out. But it's really cool because it's readable. I don't read the YAML ever. Well, but good. But if you ever want to, it's readable. And of course, YAML sucks now as well. And there's another thing called TOML, which I don't know if anyone adopted apart from Tom. Um, so yeah, you're spending all this time configuring stuff and making it human readable for what? But you configure it, you build it, and now, of course, you need to deploy it. And you know, back in the desktop or web days, like when I used to copy stuff onto the web development machine, well, I used to just copy. I used to use CPR dash, or if you're on Windows, it was X copy, or you would do an FTP. But then, of course, you're like, oh, and so sh something, I forgot a file, it doesn't work. I forgot some configuration, it doesn't work. What is happening? This was working fine on my machine, it was beautiful. What the hell happened? Why doesn't it work? Right? You had that beautiful, it works on my machine. You're like, why doesn't it work? Right? And you're like, okay, I'll tell you what, I'm going to just ship my machine. Of course, we didn't call it ship my machine, we called it Docker. And we gave it a fancy name as a container, and we said, look, this is really cool. You just do this on your machine, and it's really nice. You set up this command line thing, and you have this really, really simple file, and you just basically deploy this, and it's beautiful. It works like a charm. But of course, you, when you got to go, you don't got to go just with one, because you got to deploy all those microservices, right? So now you start with Docker Compose. And Docker Compose is much better because it allows you to kind of like run successive things all in one. But again, that's for small scale. Now remember, the majority of us uh, are, are, in the, are in the same kind of business as Netflix, right? So we can't deal with this with just Docker Compose. No, we need the full-fledged Kubernetes, right? And Kubernetes is this, uh, uh, also known as KTS is this open source system for automating, deploying, scaling, and management of containerized applications. And it facilitates all of this for you. And if you run into a problem, there's a beautiful flowchart that tells you where something went wrong. I also like this um, representation of Kubernetes. And now you've got all of this, and you need to deploy it somewhere. right? Before, of course, it was your own machine, or you had your ISP, or whatever. And uh, it was with the FTP, you had to do it. And then along came this company called Heroku, which was really, really cool. Because Heroku said, look, and I, I'm not being sarcastic. It was cool, right? It was like, OK, if you're using GitHub to get your stuff, and Heroku was Ruby on Rails, and it was great at the time, and Ruby on Rails didn't even need building. It was just basically interpreted language. And uh, it's like, well, you know what? You can, instead of pushing to your own uh, main branch, you can push to me, and then I will do some checks, and I will put that into production. It was really good. And of course, some of the large players got wind of this, and they're like, oh, we can start to take all of the infrastructure that we're using internally, that we're using, and offer that to everyone else, right? So you get Google Cloud Platform, which, uh, you know, it has so many services that, that I, you, you, yeah, I, I don't know. You don't even know what you need anymore, right? But as long as you need it, it's there in Google Cloud Platform. And uh, you have, of course, uh, you know, I'm not picking on Google here. I mean, Microsoft as well. Microsoft is emphasizing on always providing you everything for free, more things free, until, of course, at some point it's not free. Now, I was going to do a video of AWS, but it was one and a half hours long. and. I, I just couldn't, right? Um, but you can see it's got a lot of pages and there's a lot of stuff. But don't worry because there's certification courses on learning the cloud. In fact, what I do recommend though, before taking any of those certification courses, is first take a certification course on figuring out what it is that you need to learn before you do it. And chances are, by the time you finish learning, that thing is already deprecated. And there's a new service that is replacing it that is so much more better. Now, they don't call it deprecated. They call it legacy apps or legacy services. So with cloud, essentially, the promise was that we'll take away you having to manage your own server and all of that stuff and instead spend all of your money and time learning our shit. That's what it was about. But your applications will be cloud native, also known as vendor locking. Now, of course, you need to deploy all of this. You need to monitor, and you need to maintain it. And it's all about the DevOps, right? Now, I think Patrick is even here. I don't see him here, but 
maybe here, and Patrick Dubois came up with this idea of very simple of like developer and operations. The developer needs to know what the ops are doing and the ops need to know what the developers are doing. And the world said, this is such a fantastic and beautiful idea. What should we do? Let's create a whole bunch of tools around it. And there you have it. I mean, hey, we're up there as well, okay? So there you go. What did we do? We again took something that was a simple concept and we said, no, 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 we need to make this really, really complicated. But with everything like that, don't worry because there is this framework to help you cope, which is uh, to help you cope, which is called the Scaled Agile DevOps Maturity Framework or SAD MF for short. <laughs> okay, some people got that. Now, in all of this, one thing that I have left out is security. So let's talk about security. Now, security is complicated. It's the one thing that is actually complicated, right? Now, I'm not talking about the easy stuff like authentication providers and authorization. All of that is kind of easy. That's quite simple. I'm talking about this, right? This, okay? This is called open source. It's beautiful. It is wonderful. Open source is the best thing that's happened to our industry. Okay? It's otherwise known as, I just use shit for free and I don't have to go through procurement. That's what it is. Now, of course, you all heard many, many years ago the story of someone that took some file off of NPM and decided to um, remove it, uh, which was a left pad, which was that many lines of code. And, but the community thought this was outrageous, and they came together, and they provided LeftPad as a service now. So that won't ever happen again if you go to leftpad.io. But if you actually look through the ecosystem, and I, I point out NPM here, you can look through anything, you have all of these things. Like I, the, then Isere had, and this was when I took back in 2016, it had 18 million downloads. 72% dependent package, and it fits in a tweet. That was the actual library. Okay? There, we have created this concept of building blocks of literally everything. There are libraries which is, is negative, is positive, is zero negative, is zero positive, is array, is not array, is false, is something like array. I love that, is some, that I'm not making that up. Has identity crisis, okay, that one is made up, right? So what does this leave me with my little Gatsby? Well, this is my little Gatsby project, okay? Yeah? For a four-page static website. But don't worry, it's scalable. If I ever need more, I'll have it. So that 800 megabytes of packages on my drive will serve, sorry, eight megabytes, uh, more like 10 gigabytes of packages on my drive, it's there in case one day I need it. And uh, a friend of mine had this, and this game still works. I've still tried it. You just basically think of a noun, Google it. If it exists, you drink. <laughs> but anyway, coming back to security, you know, we were talking about someone did something, they were upset and they pulled a package, right? But what about the other issue that is happening now? And these are all recent. These are from March, April, February, et cetera, right? Where you have packages that are very innocent with a few lines of code and starting to inject malware. And we're like, oh, yeah, but it doesn't matter. And we have the same situation with Docker. Like, there are 9 million Docker containers in the registry. How many times do we go through them and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to put every package and every container that I use through a security audit and make sure it's A-OK. -okay. And of course, we don't even do lock-ins when we're deploying stuff. We're like, no, let's just get the latest version from NPM. Every time we build, we'll just pull the latest version. It doesn't matter. We'll just pull it and build it and deploy it. But don't worry, procurement company, procurements in companies are now on the job. They've, after this whole thing of the uh, supply chain crisis and all of that, that has really made them attentive, right? Because you now have loads and loads, like we get them all the time, like 60 page, uh, questionnaires on uh, supply chains and uh, what are you using and what, if not. And, and this one is real. I, we re recently got a, an email from someone that said to us, um, we want to make sure that your software doesn't use log4j. And we said, well, the software you're using is .NET. 
And they're like, yes, but does that mean it's using log4j or not? Right? This is it. It's essentially a checklist they need to go through. They don't give a crap. They're just like, yeah, just check this, everything okay. I've got my CYA in place, and that's it. And then we talk about supply chain attacks, right? And here we are pulling everything off the internet, using it, re rebuilding new versions without giving it much more thought. But it's going to get better. It's going to get better. All of this complexity is going to get better because we've decided that it's drowning ourselves in complexity isn't enough. We need to now drown our users as well and the population in general because making them go through 98% completion of processing a cookie when you've gone to a website or making them choose through 600 options, thank you GDPR and EU, for when you go to a website isn't enough. We think it's time for Web3, sorry, Web3. Right? And we're doing this under the promise of a more fair and distributed web. You know, you know the web where you have machines that are distributed and interconnected? Well, we're going to make it more fair by making it distributed and interconnected. Right? We call it blockchain. Now, it's not only about that. We also need crypto, right? Because crypto is going to not have us succumb to corrupt governments, such as, you know, Binance being linked to some governments. And we need NFTs. Of course we need NFTs. Like, NFTs have to be a thing. Now, I don't know how many of you know Bernie Madoff. How many have heard of Bernie Madoff? Okay, Bernie Madoff was an American forester and financier who ran the largest Ponzi scheme in history worth about 64.8 billion. He is turning in his grave right now at the NFT thing, okay? Like this guy bought a, a tweet of Jack Dorsey for 2.9 million and he lost almost 2.9 million, right? This one, um, yeah, I don't even know. Yes, anyway, uh, if, you, if you're into Web3 and you're excited about Web3, don't follow this Twitter account which is telling you all of the crap that's going on in Web3. But in summary, everything I've said, what is my point? I, I don't have much of a point. That's part of the, the talks that I give. And, and I warned you before, I said, if you want to learn something, you want to be inspired, there's nothing to, to get from this, okay? Except there are a few things that we can ask ourselves, which is the same questions we asked ourselves at the beginning. What are we doing? Like, what are we exactly doing and why are we doing it? So if you look at us, we read blogs, we go to conferences like this one, we listen to thought leaders that today are thought leaders and tomorrow are not thought leaders, and we think to ourselves, well, I want that and I need that. And so many times we forget about the context. We forget that just because Netflix needs microservices and performs all of this chaos monkey operations, we don't necessarily need to do that. Just because Uber switches from MySQL to PostSQL and writes a blog post about it, we don't need to do that. Primarily because, look, in 2013, they went from MySQL to Postgres. In 2016, they went from Postgres to MySQL. So you could have saved yourself a whole lot of money and just waited three years. And you get the same now with microservices. Now you get load, and this is one of a million, right? Oh, we went to microservices and back. What did you realize? That it was our code all along, right? But we start to do this, and we start to think, okay, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? And of course, all of this has this other side effect that I'm sure that any software developer has experienced. I surely have, which is analysis paralysis. I'm gonna start a project and I'm like, oh, you know, what, what should I use? Should I use ActiveMQ or RabbitMQ? And, or should I use DocumentDP or re Relational? And should I use microservices or monoliths? And should I? And, and you start to focus on the what as opposed to the why, as opposed to what is it that you're doing? Why are you doing it more importantly? And we get like so mesmerized by, these, by this beautiful new technologies. 
And some of us would even think that we're actually doing CV-driven development, right? Because, you know, we're focused more on what technologies we're using as opposed to what problem we are solving. And if you look at the CVs, we've, we've created this problem ourselves. Our CVs, look at anyone's CV, look what you look for. You're like, oh, they know AngularJS, they know ReactJS, uh, they know Android development, they know this, right? So we, we start to judge people on technologies, not on the problems that they've solved, not on the people that they've helped, not on the issues that they've managed to resolve, but what technologies they know. Because apparently, we are all stupid, and we cannot learn new technologies. So we've created this self-destroying industry of just focusing on technologies, hiring based on technologies, instead of hiring based on other qualifications. And of course, we have this thirst for knowledge. So a lot of times, it's like, oh, you know what? I'm going to just do this, and even if my customer doesn't need it, it's cool, because I'm going to learn Kubernetes. Instead of asking ourselves, do we really need that? Or more importantly, does my customer really need that? And yes, yeah, sure, I'm not denying there are complex systems in the world. There are. I'm not saying that every system is, is easy. Um, but, you know, what I don't fail to, to understand is why we have this urge to solve complexity by adding complexity. It's like every time we try and introduce a, a, an improvement over something, we, we make it more complex. It's like we take pride in complexity or think of it as job security, right? But we really need to move back to being more simple. We need to really understand that, and it's not an easy task, right? I'm not saying by far it's an easy task to be more simple, but we need to understand that every time you're trying to solve a problem by adding more complexity to it, that also has a cost. Now, when I say go back to simple, not using things like Vapor.js or no code, but try and abstract things by simplifying them. Because you need to appreciate that if I say, okay, I'm gonna introduce this new uh, solution to this problem, and the user has to, user being asked, developers, has to learn X, Y, and Z extra, and has to do this and that, that comes at a cost. And is it really worth the cost of the minor problem that you may be solving with this new framework or library or whatever you want to call it? And the point is, it's not only about making our li our, the lives of our users simpler, which is what we always strive for. Remember when we talk about user experience and user interface and making lives of users better and making it more performant and making it a better experience, it's also about trying to make our lives simpler not just the users, okay? Thank you.